suffer because somehow two important people, one being my brother and one being the top mind in the chat, had had answers in question. Char sent us this from the Washington Post. Black Americans more beat but fear wor worsening racism. Oh, fine. An overwhelming share of black Americans think the U.S. economic situation is stacked against them and the slim majority believe the problem of racism will worsen during their lives, according to Washington Post, Ipsos poll. That explored the attitudes of this country's second largest minority group. The poll find that black adults worry that marginalized and under threat by acts of hate and discrim discrimination in their day-to-day -day lives, most also say it is more dangerous to be a black teenager down than their work. This is the stat so y'all can see it. Nonetheless, nearly half of black Americans also say it's a good time to be a black person in this country. Up from 30% in 2020. We all know why 20. That you know, George Floyd, Trump, Got everybody wild up. U.S. was gripped with political division in Donald Trump's president and 34% last spring after a white supremacist killed 10 black people at a Buffalo grocery store. Y'all remember that story? The poll conducted among more than 1,200 black adults over two weeks in late April and May. Black Americans are more po positive about whether it's a good time to be black American. Y'all can see that poll. A rise in optimism comes amid an uptick in financial well-being. The poll finds 31% of black Americans that are final financial situation has gotten better over the past 10 years up from 25 percent in 2022 nearly 8 in 10 black americans say their finances have been stable or improved in the recent Still, black americans are less likely than white americans to rate their financial positive fear black americans also report that they have been treated with less respect or received poorer service because of their race than they did in 2011 um, although most of the incidents still occur at least once in a while so it's better to be black people it is seems like a better time Still not great. Still every once in a while. It's not like it was every day like when we were younger. It's just, it's not like this, right? Um, when it comes to national more, na nation more broadly, however, black Americans are uneasy over the nation's political and cultural environment and believe most white Americans don't trust them. Follow-up interviews with respondents show a variety of factors fueling these concerns about the future, rising hate groups, gun violence, and new laws in Florida. Florida is crazy. Other states were regulating the teaching of black history and racism. These concerns suggest that even at 86% of black Americans say they are somewhat satisfied, very or somewhat satisfied with their lives, the cumulative impact of extremism and political tension is driving widespread worry about the future of racism. This is Char's segment of this, but it led to something else. So let's get in there. My brother sent me this. And that's the other special person. He he wanted to his friend. He told me the story. He said. Friend, I'm not gonna say her name. Who is crazy enough to go out here and root and just give this idea? I said, I am. Well, he said I am. Basically, he know I I I put my hand up. Listen, I ain't scared to talk about nothing on it. I don't know about me. And the question was, is race relations a medical condition? Basically, can racism be just like the other R word? Can it be shown in the other R word? You know what the other are, are the other thing that negative impact on that people don't like to be called because it's negativity. Now, of course, people still don't like to be called racist, but for some reason we don't put it in the med mental illness segment. We don't because you can't pretend not to be something else, right? We medically clear you, but why isn't it medically clear? And he sent me two things that we're gonna go. Over. A white supremacist took MDMA for a study and it snapped him out of his belief. By the way, that is basically like a LSD type drug, a hallucinogen. It's one of them crazy drugs, you know, MDMA. And a white supremacist took this. A leader in the white, na white nationalist movement realized he wanted to change his extreme belief after he took a psychoactive, psychedelic drug, MDMA, as a part of a scientific study. The man who referred to himself as Brandon was enrolled in MDMA in February 2020, which investigated whether the drug could increase the pleasantness of human touch, according to an adaptation of the book, I Feel Love. It, MDMA and the Quest for Connection of a Fractured World by Rachel Newell, published by the BBC. After the experience, Brandon returned the form of, to the researchers and wrote, the experience has helped me sort out some debilitating personal issues google my name i now know what i need to do the research researcher looked up brandon and discovered he was a white supremacist yes he was a racist who had lost a job after being revealed as the leader of the white nationalist group 
Brandon had attended the Unite the Right rally in Charlotte 2017. Remember, that wasn't that wasn't a racist thing. It's they're good people on both sides, right? Good people on both sides. But this man was the leader of that movement and attended it and now saying he was racist. But let's see what else he said. Well, he just said he was racist. So that kind of disproved it. It's good people on both sides. Unless you're white, you don't I guess it don't matter to you. Immediately, they were concerned as to what sort of not an issue might refer to. But when they tracked him down, Brendan revealed that he, what he needed was to do was simply love. That's a, something more sinister, like hitting a woman with a car. Researchers are investigating how MDMA could be used to treat mental and physical illness. This is where this story comes into play. This is where my brother, who does this for a living, comes into place when he's like, maybe it's a mental illness because MDMA. Uh, it's a psychedelic drug. How is that helping you? I do say, I do say, it's an ecstasy drug. It's an ecstasy. I keep saying psychedelic and all this. It's an ecstasy drug. I don't know why I keep going around. It's ecstasy. You, you, you should tell by when I said the touch and feel. It's ecstasy. I don't know why I just cut around and did all the other stuff. It's ecstasy. A psychedelic drug. You two understand. Y'all like shrooms and stuff, right? MDMA is one of several psychoactive drugs that researchers are studying to assess whether they can be used to treat mental and physical illness. Insider had previously reported on its potential to treat anxiety disorders such as PTSD and alcoholism. The party drug also referred to as Molly. Wait, 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 wait. So you drop a Molly and they not racist? You drop a Molly and they not racist? Yo, you drop a Molly and they not racist. I wanted to, uh, known for causing feelings of empathy and sociability. You drop a Molly, they have empathy. You're all white people on Molly. This is yo. This is, who led the research? Told newer Harriet DeWitt. It's what everyone says about the drug that makes it people feel love. She had this mind boggling that the drug can potentially change someone believing the way it is thought to have done with Brandon. However, MDMA. MDMA doesn't have a political agenda and can't by itself solve racism. The author of one journal article of 2021 argued that psychedelics just could just amplify what is going on the purpose of it. MD MDMA, for instance, being used by the Taliban to channel connection to divine during chant. So also, it might just make them believe God wants them to do harm to us too. Or maybe not Papa Molly in all of their heads. Just the ones that I want to feel something. Brandon started therapy after taking MDMA. Then we're gonna learn more about Brandon, the white nationalist leader. But in case of Brandon, he had recently been exposed as a white supremacist, lost a job when he enrolled in the study. He had full regret of being caught. 30 minutes after taking the MDMA pill, Brandon questioned, why am I doing this? Why am I thinking this way? And wonder why he had jeopardized the relationships in his life. Then this time on a drug, he realized his life was mixing connections. Simple. M cells take Molly too. The case suggests the MDMA had the potential to influence a person's values and priorities. The author wrote in a case study about Brandon, they hypothesized that if extremist views are fueled by fear, anger, and cognitive biases, they could potentially be treated with drugs. I saw an argument that Disney took with the Thorpe girl, the weird girl, and they said LSD has no effect. Look, listen, it's proved it. Somebody tag Destiny in this. Go tag Destiny and tell them to show the girl about. How uh, ecstasy can make you not racist anymore. Maybe it can help old girl deal with whatever problem she has. Sister said it. Brandon has been trying to make changes for the better. He had a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant to help him and enrolled in therapy and began meditating. These are the moments I have when I have racist and anti Semitic thoughts, definitely, he said. But now I'm recognizing those kind of patterns are, are harming me more than anyone else. That was harming us too. But we give racist mollies now. But how can we do that effectively when we don't even know if racism is a mental illness? This is by time, again, something my brother sent me. And can we classify as a me mental illness? Can we give them drugs for it? How do we have this? Can we fix racism through artificial means or is it in the person's heart? Let's talk about is racism a mental illness? The legal implication of the debate over whether extreme racism is a mental illness. 
Everyone knows that Law and Order plot lines are often, as they say, ripped from the headline. Dr. Alvin Passant, 88 years old, knows this on another level. An emeritus professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, he has had an unusual experience of seeing his ideas incorporated into a season 12 episode of a long-running show. It is a white working stiff murder as a black CNO, CEO in a dispute over a, a New York City taxi cab. When the trials begin, as as respect as a respected black psychiatrist takes to the stand to present his idea, the defendant suffers from extreme racism or mental illness. His lawyer argued that extreme racism has such a complete hold on the defendant that it mitigates the class legal responsibility for murder. And in that final moment, the audience is encouraged to feel that it's a victory for justice and law and order when the jury rejects the psychiatrist's idea. Poussaint tells me with a tinge of disdain. In the real world, Poussaint was that psychiatrist, sort of. While he never broke out his idea of a witness stand inside the New York City courthouse behind those massive stones, steps in the law and order made famous in 1999, he shared his theories on the link between mental health and extreme forms of beverage. The op-ed pages of the New York Times in doing so, has he, he helped set off a debate that ended with the American psychiatric establishment publicly reject, rejecting the concept, falling on the ground that so many people are racist. Y'all hear it here first, listen. They they couldn't get off because he was so racist they had a hold of his mind so he got put in jail for being racist. And then you heard it yourself, listen. So many people are racist that, it, that the psychiatrics rejected the idea of Racism being a mental illness because too many people are racist. That's very, going back to the first story, that's kind of alarming. Very alarming. But even now, near, after nearly a decade during the which the number of hate crimes has steadily increased, the question of relationships between bigotry and mental illness has never been fully resolved. Let me know in the comments, do y'all think racism is a mental illness? And can we serve it with Molly? has never been a fully real. In fact, recent high-profile incidents ha have made public perception of that dynamic perhaps as muddled as ever. The issue comes up with relation to everything in the, from major mass shooting to pop culture discourse. The racist attacks at Buffalo, New York, again, the supermarket, that keeps coming up, for which a gunman pleaded guilty this week to state murder and domestic terrorism charges, prompted calls for a country to get serious about mental health. He, he said he was racist. I am talking about mental health, it's hard, to, we're going to skip that a little bit of that part. It's hard to distinguish what psychiatric experts have decided not to define. To separate what Passant calls everyday racism, covering the span from systematic discrimination and microaggressions, from the extreme version, which he had and others have described at the point where which bigotry so deeply shapes behavior that a person struggles to function and sometimes become dangerous. But the question is more than just a thought experiment. If extreme racism were to become accepted as a mental illness per se, more suspects in hate crime could potentially have a recourse to mount insanity defenses in court. That's the problem with that. And given all the mass shootings and disturbing public events in which extreme racism appears to have played some part since Poussaint first described his idea, it's hard not to wonder why development research back extreme racism diagnosis and sound treatment have saved lives. This is very interesting. This is very interesting. Though the FBI typically releases data each fall to tell in the prior year's hate crime statistics, the, the agency has not done so in 2020. But social conditions are right, experts said. The increases to continue. Police have noted that 47 out of 100 people arrested for hate crime in New York City in early 2022. I'm just skipping around a little bit. This is just mostly a bunch of articles. I'm going to link the article in the description of this video. Um, I'm going I'm to end this video for y'all right here at this moment but i'm gonna go into it a little more after so be ready for that so in the main video in the recorded video we're gonna go over more of this stuff right but right now i'm in the video for the new channel go look for the recording because i'm gonna continue after this and go watch the live we got a bunch of great stories on the live that you can just watch that we not might not put out yet and it might not come out for a week or two some stories we want to put out because we're a little bit behind that stories i'm just gonna tell you about you but for y'all that's in the recording, I'm going to even leave this in for the recording. I just want to thank y'all, like, and subscribe, all that stuff. Let's continue for the recording segment. It's complicated, says Sandra Gilman, a historian at Emory University who researched the relationship between health, science, law, and society, and who has long taught a course on extremism. 
But I'm going to start with two things that I called Gilman's Law. Not all races are crazy, but crazy people can be racist. Based in part to influence of pop culture, not least those TV police procedure. Law and order, yeah. Many assume that insanity pleas are coming. In reality, mental health defenses are rare and even more rarely led to reduced punishment. Mind that kind of defense requires time, significant research to gather the evidence and expert testimony. So in practice, it is not an avenue available to all the defendants. Yeah, it doesn't It doesn't really make sense to use that as a code. You know what I'm saying? Use that as a, like a mental illness is not something you just get off free. It shouldn't be. In England and US, courts began to reliably consider the mental health of defendant only in the 19th century, the McGotten Rule, a standard for determining the, a defendant's sanity at the time of a crime, was established in 1840. It holds that only the sane can be held responsible for the action. As a result, the question of mental fit, fitness, sufficient sanity to participate in being, meaningfully in one's own defense, is sometimes varied before a trial. Whether the state has an obligation or right to treat such an illness in order for that person to stand trial, given there's a question that goes far as back as the idea of such a defense. Competency decision has been made. The accused who do go to trial has the right to a defense. In some cases, that may include an option for a jury to find a defendant not guilty by reason of mental disorder. And others, ideas about the mental health of the defendant may more informally shape the evidence presented. But so-called mental disease or defect defenses are used only in court about 1% of cases, said Michael Buka, a professor at the State University of New York. By the way, I apologize if I didn't share your name. An expert in on mental health and other associated in the courtroom. Those defenses are successful even in fewer cases, such as tactics often backfire or results in the defendant being confined for a longer time instead of a hospital than a person who would just spent prison sometimes in no end date. And rare that, though, now I heard an attempt to use racism or other bigotry as an indicator of mental health. Change. So you can technically go to jail alone. You can go to jail alone. So, so if you use that excuse, they can be like, oh, just lock him up and never let him out. Did he get better? That can never happen. I think it would be extremely hard to because, I mean, extreme hard to succeed on the theory that extreme racism, per se, particularly subscription to a theory, is a mental illness for the purpose of criminal responsibility. I do too. I don't think you can actively say, oh yeah, that's that person is mentally ill because he's racist, so he should be, you know. That's the one problem I have with it. Like, if you use the shame portion, thank you, but criminally, would you be obligated to use it in a criminal disorder too? We, but the thing is, we see it, it doesn't really work, right? Less than 1% of cases even use it or are available to use it. And even less than that actually gets it correct. And most time it includes longer things. So should we use it? This is extended period. So y'all let me know in the comments. Should you use this? Just because you have a psychologist or psychiatrist saying this person is mentally ill does not mean the law has to accept it. Nor does the defendant Dylan Roof, the white man who shot and killed nine black worshippers inside a Charleston, South Carolina church in 2004. 15, who legal team used the word delusional, abnormal, suicidal to describe their client, rejected advice from his lawyers to attempt to avoid death penalty by allowing them to argue that he was insane, suffering from a mental defect at the time of the shoot. Some fear that raising mental health issues in a courtroom, the risk of bolstering inaccurate myths about mentally ill, in reality, mentally ill people are disproportionately more likely to become a victim of a crime. True. And most do nothing to victimize others. And, ha and as has been observed by so many headline making crime, Suspects from privileged groups are more likely to have their action described as illness in need of treatment instead of criminal evil marriage punishment. That point. White people tend to get more mentally ill. I don't know if y'all noticed. White people, I, I do apologize. I don't. I don't mean I'm lying. Y'all get away. Y'all, every day. Oh, he's just mentally unwell. When a black person shoots him, he's a monster, animal, creature. Y'all know it's true. Y'all don't lie to me. Don't pretend. Don't sit here and patronize me in ways to say, listen, that don't happen. Trevor, we all even know it don't. You know good well it don't happen. You know good and well that victims, people that really have mental illness, are most likely victims. And people that use that just use that for their evil. Even though I could consider racism a mental illness, which I'm kind of on leaning on. Come on now. Uh, some experts fear that shifting the conversation questions of mental health can also draw attention away from hateful ideas embraced by the person accused of the crime. Ideas that are often shared today by people, including public figures who use mental health, is not questioned. And that's how important social problems that require a nation's attention are transformed into one individual medical process, says W. Carson Beard, a sociologist 
at university, man. A line that think is particularly problematic in a culture prone to dismiss the need of system-wide reform to address inequality, Bird said. It can follow an emphasis, foster an emphasis, on quick fixes for the long world's long-standing problem with bigotry. In 2012, in 2012, for an example, a team of British research announced that an existing heart and blood pressure drill appeared to reduce implicit bias after study involved 36 studies. White supremacy is not is a very normal part of society, said Bird, who was also a faculty director at the research initiative at his university national for institutional diversity. It is not a good or productive part of society, he points out, but a deeply entrenched one. One of the detriment of trying to look at racism as a form of psychopath psychopathology or mental illness is that it makes illness abort as if everything is worked for a certain non-racist way. It does. I agree. What he's saying, if y'all don't understand it, it makes, it normalizes racism in a way. Like, oh, it's a condition. They can't help it. I mean, in most, in, not in, in all cases, they can help not liking me for the color of my skin. Even though I do happen to think you hate me for my skin color is insane and probably is a mental illness, but at the same time, the, the thing around mental illness right now is literally, literally, oh, they can't help it. And it's not their fault. Researchers has long showed that bigotry is not an inborn human trait, but rather something learned from our environment, of course. Bridget said, while racism can influence one's mental health, describing racism itself, even in extreme racism, as a mental illness applied to bigotry exists beyond our individual and collective control. But as I said, simple, I simplified it. I simplified it so y'all know. By medicalizing extreme racism, making it something curable, a mental health disorder, it pulls away from those who have brought a conversation about how society is impacting people. He said, we try to figure it out. The problem, Bukhan notes, can already be cleared, clearly seen in discussion about gun crime, mass shootings in particular. It's very hard to understand these crimes, the discourse and insanity provides one way to do it, says Bukhan. But I think we can see where the sort of language is irresponsible but potentially undermines it. You see Poussaint wrote his op-ed advocating for increased research into possible psychiatric treatments for extreme racism. This is very interesting. I don't know how y'all thought. Y'all can go read this article. It's very good by time, by the way. Y'all want to read it. I don't um, I don't want to bore you because it's very long and I don't want to have this video too long. But basically, the, the whole thing is Racism alone is not sufficient to diagnose a patient with you, with one of those conditions, but an extreme racist like the suffers from delusion, project negative traits and outcomes. You can say that the same thing about incels. It's not just racism, it's incels. It could be these red pill dudes, some of them. Not the people that's grifting off of them, just the people out there who hate women so much because they don't, they don't know. It's a lot of these traits you can use, but you don't want to justify it. That's the scary thing about it. But at the same time, you kind of do want to shame them. So we live in a very dynamic thing, which I wanted to know. It is probably a mental illness that probably happened, but at the same time, do you want to give it the same mental illness treatment that you give every other mental illness and like you can't control it? Because I think this may be a controlled mental illness. from your environment, from other things. I think it's very much controlled. And I want to know y'all thoughts. What do y'all think? How can, how can we fix this? How, if we put in mental illness, what we do? Let me know in the comments. Just let me know. I just want to. I don't know y'all thoughts. Do we diagnose it as mental illness? Um, do we just change the stigma around mental illness? We can just change the stigma, right? Yeah, we can just change the stigma around mental illness and make it like unacceptable. We see in the court of law, according to all these reports we read, in the court of law, yeah, it's not not considered like you can just get off, which we which I was worried about. But it's interesting because I want to know the most powerful thing. Y'all let me know in the comments below. Let, let me know your thoughts. How do you end racism? Thank y'all for liking the video. Like and subscribe, all that stuff. Thank y'all for watching, man. I appreciate you. Is racism a mental illness? And if so, how do we stigmatize it? Let me know in the comments. All that. Love y'all. One last time, like, subscribe. We have a great channel. Go watch the Thursday show. Um, it's a shorter version of this video in there, but I do want to do, do, do a long form video. Shout out to my brother again. I am the crazy dude who will cover this. I appreciate y'all. Peace. Wait, wait, before I go, I do want to read this one sentence. I do want to read this. I know I said I'm gone, but I had to read this one lesson. We, but this is about the Poussaint guy over right there. I did want to read this last part. I forgot. My fault. We, we get a, basically, this is how he would describe the last case for what I said earlier. This is, this is the last case. We get away from treating it as extreme racism is normative. Okay. 
Basant says, like a cultural difference because America is a racist country, we have made it a normative by not calling it what it is. Even people in general society, friends and relatives, and even afflicted individuals would recognize it as a disorder and say, I'm not all right. People who get swept up by anxiety and can't function, they don't think they are normal. They say they, this is taking over my life. I need help. A diagnosis clues the family to say this is a person that's really troubled and we have to give them some help. This is the argument. The stigma thing I said earlier, this is the argument against it. We realize we have a problem. We should call it out and seek help for it instead of trying to pretend like we don't. So we would call it that but not stigmatize it or not make it normal. Because as you as we saw earlier, in court cases, you don't really go through. But it's a very interesting thing. Again, let me know after reading this. Let me know again because I know I started earlier. It's a lot more. I do apologize, but I love y'all, man. Peace. Shout out to Shar and my brother one more time.